Galileo, he had a daughter who was a nun. He had two daughters who were both nuns. And one of them was a very, very devoted daughter and wrote to him all the time, and he wrote back. Um, his letters back have never been discovered, probably because they were burned, because he was a heretic, and if they were found at the abbey there, well, he was considered a heretic. And this, this deals somewhat with that. Um, he was a very, very faithful individual, had a really, really strong faith in God, and uh, I thought that was interesting that he would be sort of chosen as the heretic of the era when he had daughters who were nuns and who were also really just, I was reading through those letters and they had this really unflinching devotion to God in a way that no one in our era could probably muster up, um, just believing that everything had its plan and um, I'm fascinated by, by that concept, especially coming from a scientist who's always looking for answers, but constantly believing that the answers really come from this above. So, uh, Galileo, upon the death of Maria Celeste. These days, my eyesight beginning to fail, confined to my home by health and by law, I find myself gazing not to the skies, but to San Mateo, where my daughter once lived. She mended my collars and bleached them, took upon my penances, sent fresh plums, remedies of dried rhubarb and saffron, tonics of aloe washed in rose water. In summer, I brought lemons, rosemary, oranges for my daughter. In springtime, I watched her die. I have made a mistress of truth. For this, I will be remembered grinding lenses, defending the phases of Venus, and yet on full moon nights, I turn my telescope to the walls of the cloister, though I know my daughter cannot be found in bricks or old letters, Jupiter's moons, nor any space visible from Earth. Soon I shall be blind, though I have seen farther than any man before, when Maria Celeste was a girl, snow fell on Fiorenza, and she thought it was marzipan sent from God, though I explained it as little more than frozen rain. She was right somehow, aware of miracles in the transformation of color, shape, density. Faith has room for both answers. The earth still moves. I'm grateful to God. I grew up in Chicago, and that definitely plays into my poetry, particularly if it, um, and my songs. Uh, in Chicago, you really, well, flowers are a luxury for starters, which is why I was sort of going after this, but in my own family, there's a, there's a huge amount of like guilt, <laughs> and like Catholic guilt, <laughs> And um, just sort of like, you're always having to be careful with everything you do, which, which also might play into my poems. But um, there's an emphasis on perfectionism and staying quiet and filling your role, um, which is probably true in, in a lot of cultures. But um, that's the sort of environment that I grew up in. My parents are wonderful people, but um, we all sort of kept to our roles. Um, and that's what this came out of, I guess. Arrangement at a Midwestern supermarket. Three calla lilies, wrapped in green tissue and imprinted clear plastic, I bought for the cost of a small lunch, knowing full well that in a week's time they will smell of swamp and rotting carcass. I should be punished for these flowers unjustified by hospital or holiday, not a gift for anyone. Seattle was different. Purple peonies arranged haphazard like balls of lavender ice cream and beige newsprint horns of pl plenty. Roses traded fragrance with salmon, black pepper, coffee, and women walked with large extravagant bundles of petals like carnival prizes won by absent beloveds. 
How strange, now, to ride my bike through Chicago streets with a small bouquet tucked in the basket between frozen dinners and cereal, here where lilies are awarded for grand performances. Compensation for suffering. And the last one that I'm going to read for the moment is um, called On Alicia Ostreicher's Theory of the Nature of Intimacy. Uh, Alicia, Alicia Ostreicher is a really, I don't know if you guys studied her at all or no. Um, she's a fantastic sort of feminist poet and beyond. Um, I mean, I wouldn't just restrict her to that label, but um, she came in and read to a class right at the time when I was really having a hard time um, writing anything, poems, songs, anything, because I think there was a lot that I was sort of not wanting to delve into. Um, if you want to write poems, stories, whatever, you have to be open to the fact that stuff might come up that you don't want to come up. Um, so, you know, beware if you're in a happy, healthy relationship or you, you know, are supposedly on good terms with your family or there's a lot of stuff that lurks under the surface and it comes up and you don't want to write about it sometimes. Um, and I think we just do a lot of emotional suppression, which is another Midwestern thing. Um, and she was talking about how she personally had a lot of anger against her mother who was aging, um, dying actually. Um, and she had this sort of resentment seeing her mother suffer like this and she felt ashamed to express it. And until she actually started writing about it and writing these sort of angry poems against God and against her mother, and, um, until she was able to open that up and cover both sides of the story, the good and the bad, uh, she wasn't really able to write anything. And hearing that at that point in my life was um, exactly what I needed to hear. And so this was um, my sort of humorous response to her theory of the nature of intimacy. So it's called on Alicia Ostreicher's Theory of the Nature of Intimacy. As I listen to the poet in the orange sweater speak of mothers blocked volcanoes, and how we reserve the purest fury for those we worship. I thought of how you like to take a pear from the kitchen counter and sit on the couch where I'm reading, leaning closer to pat my knee or rub my back. You will ask how I'm enjoying my book, and as I reply, you will commence the sucking and slurping, gnawing your pear as the juice dribbles down your chin. My shoulders will tighten like a loaded crossbow while I consider the consequences of slapping the pear from your hand or storming outside with a scream to rival the volume of smoke alarms. Know then that you are near as child, brother, wife, father. Only with you do I allow such collar to surge in my throat, pressing against my clavicle. I've opened the door to my chest so wide that the pulp of a pear stuck on your lip can send me into fits. <laughs>